Hello, everyone. Welcome back to people who are in the room in Cambridge in Downing Place Church. Welcome to the people who are joining us um, via YouTube Live. You're all more than welcome to this communion service, which is closing the Open Table National Gathering for 2020. And we will be celebrating communion during this service, so if you would like to have a little something to eat and drink during the service, please feel free to get something um, if you are at home and all is ready here in the room. And so I'm going to hand you over to Nigel for our opening responses. So these words are based on Psalm 118. Give thanks to God, for God is good. When hard pressed, I cried to God. God is with me. I will not be afraid. The stone the builders rejected. God has done this. God has done it this very day. Give thanks to God, for God is good. We're going to sing together again. This one is another chant. It'll be new to all of you because it's a new chant. So I will sing it once through, and then we'll sing it together three times. Cornerstone, enduring love. Cornerstone, enduring love. Cornerstone, and your ring. temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John because it was evening. They put them into jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, 
and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they performed a notable sign, and we can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading further along the, among the people, we must warn them to no longer speak to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach it or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So we come to a prayer, a time of prayer. Maybe these words will speak for us. Maybe they'll speak to us. But I've never known a prayer that spoke to or for everyone or said everything that anyone wants to say. So we'll spend a moment in the quietness and then this prayer will be offered.
we raise our voices to you, our Creator, and with one accord we proclaim that you are God, God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And so we, beloved creations, gather here to give thanks to you who made your light shine on us. The stone rejected by human builders became the cornerstone. And we give thanks that we too, living stones, have a place in your community. We give thanks that no human hatred or mortal fear can deny us a place in what you are building. We give you thanks that you, our creator and architect, have gloriously and wonderfully made us exactly the right shape and size of living stone to fit into the foundation of your new community. We're not just accepted, but needed. Not just equal, but more than equal. Not just welcomed, but celebrated. Grant that we, your servant stones, may be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak your word with boldness, that we may find the words to proclaim your love to those who feel rejected and assure them of your grace and their place in your plan. Amen. May God open our eyes to the glory of God, our ears to the word of God, our mouths to the praise of God, and our hearts to the love of God. Amen. It's a real privilege to be here to preach at this open table national gathering. It's a privilege to be here during Pride Month, and it's going to be pride that I'm going to be talking about uh, in this reflection. I feel I have to give a disclaimer here. Um, <clears throat> I'm here as an ally, uh, for the most part sat on the sidelines. I've only been to a couple of Pride events. I'm not involved in many campaigns, I tend to stick to my lane talking about the Bible. And so it's with some trepidation that I'm going to speak about pride. I'm aware I'm not doing it as an insider for whom this is a matter of life and death, not for someone who this is their very core of being, but I'm here as a cis straight man who's also white, also privileged in many other ways. So I'm going to beg your indulgence and forgiveness in advance if I say things inelegantly or inappropriately. And if I do, please do come up to me afterwards and tell me so I can get it better next time. Um, but it's not going to stop me from talking about pride today. Why celebrate pride? Because let's start with the name. Let's be honest. The word pride can evoke some negative associations. Haughtiness, arrogance, I checked, we all know it's one of the seven deadly sins, but traditionally pride, hubris, is often seen as the worst of the deadly sins. The arrogance leads to all the other sins, thinking that you are better and more important than anyone or anything else. 
And here we've got a whole month celebrating it. Because the opposite of pride, people will say, well, that's humility. And we know that humility is a good thing. We know that's a good thing because Jesus tells us it's a good thing. Blessed are the meek. All who exalt themselves will be humbled. All who humble themselves will be exalted. And so this week I saw on Twitter a tweet from Franklin Graham, the conservative Christian, uh, asking why don't we have humility month or something along those lines. So why celebrate pride? The English language is funny because some words can have more than one opposite. The opposite of right is wrong, except when the opposite of right is left. The opposite of sweet is sour. Unless you're talking about wine, in which case the opposite of sweet is dry. And of course the opposite of dry is usually wet, not sweet. So we have these weird things where there's multiple opposites sometimes. And so here's another opposite of pride. Rather than humility, can I suggest the opposite of pride can be shame. And shame is one of those things that's both individual and social. It's something that we can feel inside ourselves in that knot in the stomach that can form when you've either done something wrong or feel embarrassed or humiliated. But it's also the stigma with which other people can treat you, both individual, communal. And I better put it on the record that shame in itself is not always a bad thing. Some things we should feel ashamed about and be shamed for. And, okay, being honest, in some areas, I wish there was a lot more shame. I look at what some politicians have done, and I wonder why they seem to feel no shame. When they are found guilty of sexually assaulting others, or when they incite insurrection, or when they lie to Parliament or hold parties during lockdowns. I'm not having a go at shame here. But it is worth noting the effects of shame when it is present, rightly or wrongly. It leads to avoidance. It leads to silence. It leads to hiding away. Now, it is present in the majority British culture today, but it's less important than it used to be. Less, say, than in Victorian times, when you'll know that you know, one of the key virtues for Victorian times was respectability. And the opposite of that is akin to shame. And this is where I segue to the New Testament, because the world of the New Testament was more like Victorian times than it is the current day. Honour and shame were really important. Social scientists would call it an honour-shame culture. Shame is a big deal in the New Testament. And if we don't understand that, sometimes we can miss large chunks of the New Testament and what's going on. Here's a quick example. When we think about the crucifixion in the West and the suffering of Jesus, we tend to think of the physical pain that he suffered. We think of the flogging that he endured. And we think of the nails going through the hands and the feet. And you can see an example of that in the Mel Gibson film, The Passion of Christ, where that sort of... um, concentrated on that physical pain that Jesus undergoes and I'm not saying that that's wrong but when I was at theological college I had a Coptic teacher that's the Egyptian church uh, very similar to the Eastern Orthodox Church but also very different 
And he said that in Eastern Christianity, it's not the pain of the cross that's important, it is the shame of the cross. That this is someone who was being publicly humiliated, stripped of his clothes, scorned, whipped, made a spectacle before everyone, before undergoing what was usually a slave's death. And that's how the Roman authorities worked. If you rebelled in any way, particularly if you were a slave, there was this slow, painful, shameful, dishonorable death. And the effect was to silence dissent, to stop rebellion, to keep people in their place. And then we get the story of Acts. And it doesn't work. The shame doesn't work. The followers of Jesus are meant to be cowed into silence. They've just had their leader executed. And they don't shut up. And the narrative we heard today from Acts 4 is one example from the whole book. And Peter and John are passing by one of the temple gates in Jerusalem and they're healed in the name of Jesus, a man who had been lame since birth. And then they tell the crowd about Jesus. And we joined the account uh, from when Sarah was reading it. Um, When the temple police turn up, and because it's quite late, they can't do anything there and then, so they sling them into jail overnight. Um, until they know what to do with them the next day. And the next morning, they're brought in some, some type of council. We don't know how legal it was, but the high priests are there, Annas, Caiaphas, and the others, and they're interrogated. And there would have been a similar setup to this, actually, sort of a, a semicircle of the great and the good, and uh, Peter and John placed at the front. They're in trouble. And in response, Peter speaks the truth. He tells them the truth about Jesus. He tells them the truth of what he and John have experienced. The authorities don't like it. They decide that Peter and John should be told to be silent, shut it down, hide the story away. Peter, in response, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. He keeps telling the truth, frankly. Sometimes shame is good, but sometimes, let's face it, it's bad. It's used to hide the truth. It's used by the powerful against the powerless. It's used as a way to oppress, to silence, to put down, to humiliate, to control. But the covering of shame begins to crack when the truth is spoken publicly. Peter speaks in the temple amongst the people. Peter speaks in the council amongst the powerful. And Peter promises to keep speaking the truth, come what may. The covering of shame begins to crack when the truth is spoken courageously. Peter speaks when arrested. Peter speaks when warned. Peter speaks despite being offered a form of don't ask, don't tell. 
speaking the truth frankly, publicly, and courageously. There's a word for that in the New Testament. Now, for my day job, I work at a theological college where I help, amongst other things, train people for ministry. Um, and I also teach Greek and I critique sermons. And so I always say, even if you know it, do not include Greek in sermons. It's a sure way to lose people. So, let's talk about Greek. <laughs> um, I don't know if you noticed, but in verse 13, there was a reference to the boldness of Peter and John. They spoke boldly. Now, there's an old saying, to translate is to betray. Uh, the translators haven't made a bad choice there in using the word boldness or boldly, but it's limited compared to what the original word covers and includes and evokes. And the Greek word that gets translated there as boldness is parasia. And it's a word that you can find throughout Acts. It keeps on cropping up. And you can also find it in the letters of the New Testament as well. And the early church considered this parasia to be a great virtue. Great, I've given you a Greek word and said it's important. Thank you, what do I do with that? Um, I better carry on. Parasia is speaking truth to power. It is speaking truth to power frankly and publicly and courageously. Now, I should say, by the way, it's seen as a great virtue, but even so, it's not always appropriate to speak the truth openly, frankly, and bravely and courageously. Some of you may be in positions where you are unable to do that for all sorts of extremely good reasons to do with your safety or the safety of others. Jesus himself, at one point we're told in the book of John, stopped speaking with Parasia boldly, but only to his disciples for a while. So I'm not saying that everyone always needs to be completely open, because that's unfair on some of you. But if you can, then this is a New Testament virtue, speaking truth to power, frankly, publicly, courageously. And it's what gets prayed for at the end of that passage we heard. They had a prayer and the church prayed for, and now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness, with all boldness. Parasia. And this is what, empowered to speak with Parasia by the Holy Spirit, they did, which is why we have the book of Acts, and I guess why we're all here today, because they didn't stop speaking, and so other people found out about God's love. What I want to suggest today is that pride is a form of parasia. Throughout history, the powerful have tried to shame those who are LGBTQIA+. They encourage silence, hiddenness, don't ask, don't tell, Sweep it under the carpet, be ashamed, or we don't talk about them. Pride is an occasion to speak the truth frankly, to tell the world that we humans are diverse, that love is not confined, that God's children are wonderful in all their variety, and that is to be celebrated, not hidden. Pride 
speaks that truth frankly, not pretending that everyone is cis and straight. But pride also speaks that truth publicly. It isn't hidden. It cracks open that covering of shame and exposes truth to the glorious light. And pride speaks that truth courageously. From the beginnings in 1970, on the first anniversary of the Stonewall uprisings, after the continued harassment, it has continued to be a brave speaking of truth to power. And, sadly, after more than 50 years, you still need bravery, you still need courage in a context that recently has seen a toxic moral panic whipped up, particularly against trans people, but spreading to the whole of the LGBTQIA plus communities. Truth to power, frankly, publicly, courageously. This month, I'm guessing many of you will take part in Pride marches, Pride events, Pride activities. As you do so, know that you are embodying that virtue valued by the early church, that virtue that is parasia, speaking the truth of LGBTQIA plus people to power, frankly, publicly, and courageously. As Peter and John spoke with Parasia in the book of Acts. And as you do this, my prayer is that as they prayed for Peter and John, may the Spirit of God empower you to speak, to act with Parasia, this pride. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. In the URC, when we're ordained, we promise to speak the truth of the gospel no matter what trouble may arise. So recognising that Parasia comes with trouble, we're going to sing now, Faithful One, you are my rock in times of trouble, and we'll sing it through twice.
On the 18th of November last year, we received another international inquiry by the website, this time from Nejmi in Turkey. He's one of a number of growing inquiries we are receiving. He said this, Hello, my name's Nejmi. I'm a Christian and gay. I'm from Turkey. Jesus found me 11 years ago. I want to keep in touch with people who are like me. It just feels free to text you. Thank you very much for your time. Over the last six months, I've met online with him, listened to his story, the challenge of being a Christian from a Muslim background in an Islamic country, hiding his sexuality as best as he could from everyone, dodging the questions about when he was finally going to find himself a good wife, his experience with churches and missionaries, being outed by a church leader and having to leave the city that he was living in. And just in February, having to run from his building as an earthquake rocked his city, Antakya, leaving his home destroyed and 28,000 dead around him. And last month he succeeded in his bid to emigrate to somewhere where he could practice his faith in freedom and live his sexuality openly. He's now in Brisbane, Australia, and said this to me just last week. I enjoyed the church. I want to visit again. It's full of gay people. And a gay man was reading the Bible and leading. The worship is incredible. It's a gay church, but worships and sermons are good. <laughs> they really focus on God. I loved it so much. It's where I can feel God's presence and hear his word. By the way, Australian people are amazing. They are so friendly. Many inquiries, however, reveal a deep need and pain. Vera, a trans woman from South Sudan, one of 200,000 refugees in the Kakuma camp in northwestern Kenya, said this. Trauma, depression and anxiety are killing me, making my painful memories catch up with my ugly present, resulting in a disastrous mix. I'm losing my dignity, my freedom and my faith in humanity. I feel horrible, terrified, uncomfortable nervous and very sad. But God knows each of them just as he knows each of us and at the same time we receive an inquiry from Father Anthony, a former Anglican priest based in northwest Kenya, who because of his support of all, especially the LGBT community, um, is now serving in a different ministry. We connected them together and Father Anthony was able to visit them in the Kakuma refugee camp. Not all the stories have such a happy ending. And today we'd like to highlight the situation in Uganda, where, from where we've received numerous inquiries. Frank, for example, said, I'm writing to you because I see you're an advocate for LGBT rights, seeking your sincere support. I'm gay and my family and friends take it as a curse. To be honest, I didn't choose this. It's just me. Wherever you go, everyone looks at you with disgust in the community. People have always been there trying to bring me down for it's unacceptable to be gay here. All that was still manageable while it was someone insulting me without harm until the words turned into actions. Right now I can't freely move or express myself unless I'm looking for death. We've been corresponding with several human rights organizations and grassroots networks as well as individuals who are facing the frightening situation of the recent legislation in Uganda that severely limits their activities. Uganda already had laws prohibiting male same-sex relationships from the British colonial era, but the recent anti-homosexuality bill offers life imprisonment for homosexuality, death penalty for aggravated homosexuality, 20 years in prison for promotion, which they see as support of homosexuality, 10 years in prison for attending what purports to be a same-sex marriage, seven years for renting premises to anyone who might engage in homosexual activity, and five years in prison for failing to report homosexual activity, all of which allows the government to force conversion therapy on those who are convicted. There are only 11 other countries in the world which have same-sex relations punishable by death, all of them Muslim countries. And yet, the most reverend Dr. Stephen Samuel Kazimba Mugulu, Archbishop of the Church of Uganda, writes, 
The Church of Uganda welcomes the diligent work of Parliament and His Excellency the President in crafting the Anti-Homosexuality Act 2023. This ensures that Uganda does not set a legal precedent that will be difficult to overcome in the future. We thank the President for not surrendering to the threats of LGBTQ affirming countries and for, for protecting Uganda from their paths of self-destruction. The Bible teaches and scientific studies have shown that children flourish when they're raised by both their mother and father. This is the African way. This is the biblical way. And this is the way shown to us through natural law. The effects of the bill have been catastrophic. It's given freedom to anyone for mob lynchings, arrests. The safe houses have been closed. People out on the streets homeless. Denial of access to medical services for fear of being thought to be promoting homosexuality. Withdrawal of support, help and advice. It's a very difficult time for support agencies. And whilst we are a, a UK charity, we want to stand together with our brothers, sisters, siblings in Uganda. Various ways we can do that. Advocacy. You can write to your MP. There's a petition which is available. Giving is available to human rights groups who are working into Uganda. But today, we'd like to pray. I'd invite Peter to come and join me as we pray for the LGBTQ plus community in Uganda. I pray for these, our brothers, sisters and siblings, and may our prayer and solidarity sustain them. Psalm 72, verses 12 to 14 says, For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save them from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Jesus, word incarnate, you came to give honour to those forgotten, overlooked and misjudged, to the misunderstood and undervalued, to all who are rejected, abandoned and mistreated. You came to us as one of us, vulnerable to our shared human condition, yet also bringing the love of God as a real and tangible presence in the world. So help us to be that presence today. Help us to love as you would love, to care as you would care, to pray as you would pray. Let our hearts touch where our hands cannot. Let our tears speak when our words fail. And may our prayers bring comfort to those in distress. We pray for vulnerable LGBTQ plus people across Uganda and ask you for protection from evil and from those who would harm them. For secure and safe places to live. Adequate food and clean water. For resources to maintain personal dignity and hygiene. People they can trust. Those who will be there for them, friends and supporters. And people prepared to advocate on their behalf. Access to health care and medication. Support with mental and emotional health. Dignity and worth, value and respect as individuals. For opportunities to work and to be fulfilled. Peace in the present situation and hope for the future. Also for the human rights and constitutional appeal process. And God, for the repeal of this destructive and abusive legislation. Lord, we also pray for Uganda's lawmakers, Christians and church leaders. Move and stir their hearts. Awaken them with your righteousness and mercy. 
so that they would recognize the humanity and vulnerability of LGBTQ plus people in Uganda and pursue justice and compassion rather than judgment and victimization. And Lord God, we pray for ourselves. Help us to be your ears to listen to their cries. Your voice offering them love and acceptance as we also speak out on their behalf. And your arms to embrace and defend them. Lord, give us deep empathy, moral clarity and persistent courage. Help us to stay present, be prayerful and compelled to action to be active participants in your kingdom here on this earth. Strengthen each one of us to speak up for those whose voices are not heard and whose plights are ignored. May we be a people marked by justice, mercy and humility. For you will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. You will take pity on the weak and the needy and save them from death. You will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in your sight. Amen. So come to this table, those of you who have much faith and those of you who wish they had more. Those of you who have been to this table often those who come rarely, those who have never been before, come. This is Christ's table, and it's Christ that's inviting us to this feast today. And so we give thanks for these offerings. Loving God, hope's cornerstone, we give thanks for these gifts of bread and of wine, gifts of your creation. In community, together, we celebrate Christ's presence among us today, as it always is. We give thanks that we are made one in Christ's body, and we offer ourselves, our hands, our hearts, and our lives in thanks. Amen. Amen. And we join together in the words of the thanksgiving. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to God. Let us give thanks to our Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and having blessed it, he broke the bread. And he gave it to each one of his disciples. And he said, This is my body given for you. In the same way, he took wine and, having given thanks for it, he poured it out and gave the cup to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new relationship with God. Take this and share it. I shall drink wine with you in the coming community of God. And so nothing remains except to ask the architect artisan, the cornerstone, the Holy Spirit to breathe on us and on this bread and on this wine so that they may become for us the body of Christ, the joining together of community, changing us, blessing us, that we may be filled with that same spirit, with that parousia, with that boldness, so that we may go out speaking truth to power, with courage and honesty, you are this. So, my friends, my kindred, join this meal, knowing that here you are fully and freely loved.
Let's come before God in prayer. God of new things, thank you for picking us to be your living stones, for building us into this beautiful community. May this gift beyond words sustain us for the journey ahead, however long it may be. Amen. So we're going to sing together for the final time today and this song is an upbeat one. It's a song that we often sing as the Iona community when we're on a pilgrimage, when we are traveling together. It's a song of movement. It's a song of recognizing that our journey towards speaking truth to power can be one of challenge, but it is one in which we are together and we'll sing it lots and lots of times. So if you're the last one singing, it's okay. So we're gonna sing, come with me for the journey is long. 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 The journey, the journey, 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 the journey is long. Come with me for 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 the journey is long. The journey, the journey, 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 the journey is long. Come with me for 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 the journey is long. The journey, the journey, the journey is long. Journey, the journey, the journey is long. The journey, the journey, the journey is long. The journey, the journey, the journey is long. Come with me for 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 the journey is long. Journey, the journey, the journey is long. The journey, the journey, the journey is long. The journey, the journey, the journey is long. The journey, the journey, the journey is long. Go with love, my friends. Go boldly. Go with Parisia. Go to speak that truth to power where you can. Go with God's love. Go with grace. Go to seek justice. And go with hope in your hearts. May God's blessing be with you today and always. Amen.